Good afternoon, actually, um, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm Patty Owen, the uh, current president of UCRAB, uh, the UC Retirees Association at Berkeley. So I welcome all of you. Um, I am pleased to um, welcome Dean Henry Brady as our speaker today. Um, he is the Goldman School, the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy and the class of 1941 Monroe Deutsch, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy. Um, he received his PhD in e Economics and Political Science from MIT in 1980. Um, he's written on electoral politics and political participation, social welfare policy, political polling, and statistical methodology. And he's worked for the Federal Office of Management and Budget and other organizations in Washington, DC. Um, he has written many books, uh, many articles, has won many awards. His most recent book um, is Unequal and Unrepresented, Political Inequality and the People's Voice in the New Gilded Age. Um, so we are very, very pleased to have Dean Brady with us and I turn it over to him. Thank you, Patty. It's so, so great to see you again. I mean, after all these years and I certainly remember interactions with you in the past on personal matters and other issues. So uh, uh, it's great to have you here and to be here. Uh, I wish I could be meeting with everybody in person. Uh, at least that we can all breathe uh, in the Bay Area better air than we've had recently. Um, that's a great boon. Uh, I certainly was getting frustrated by it. Um, what I want to talk about is trust and uh, how trust has been injured in America uh, and what we need to think about with respect to trust and how we need to repair it. Um, here's the situation, as you all know, that we face right now. The COVID-19 pandemic. It's killed at least a million people worldwide, almost 200,000 people domestically. Uh, deaths peaked on May uh, 6th, and there's been a, another recent peak in early uh, August, and it's not clear where the pandemic is going into the future. The economy's lost tens of millions of jobs, and we're at 8.4 percentage uh, points uh, unemployment, very high for unemployment rate. There's concerns uh, about the murder of African Americans by police and about racism in America, and that's led to a racial reckoning uh, where, where, that we're all dealing with. Uh, probably a good thing for America to come try to come to grips finally, uh, if it ever will finally, uh, with respect to racism in America, but nevertheless it adds another element of concern and difficulty to the current times. And then on top of that, we just recently uh, and still have wildfires in Northern California that have created incredibly bad air quality and reminded us of climate change and the worries we have to have about that. So in the midst of all this, we have distrust of experts. We hear it daily in the political commentary. Uh, distrust of science, distrust of the news media, uh, distrust of the police, uh, distrust of many other institutions. What is that all about? Well, consider this. Suppose I started to tell you that Darwinism is wrong, uh, creationism's right, uh, vaccinations are a bad idea, uh, the anti-vaxxers are right, fluoridation is terrible and a communist plot, and in fact the sun goes around the earth and the earth is flat. Um, oh, and by the way, hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine is really a cure uh, for COVID. Somewhere along the way, you might start to doubt me. But why? None of you are simultaneously experts in all the fields that I just touched upon. Uh, and indeed, some of you may be experts in particular fields, but certainly not in all of them have to do with astronomy and biomedical science and uh, all sorts of other things. So why do you have the beliefs you have? Why would you immediately dismiss me? And I think you would if I made those kinds of statements. Um, you probably believe what you believe because of institutions that have produced these ideas, either the producers of the institutions you believe in, or you've been members of those institutions and you believe those institutions tell the truth. So what are the institutions in America that are really fundamental? Well, obviously government, uh, but there's also other institutions uh, that are very fundamental and many of these are non-political in a way that government's not. Um, there's the professions, 
law, medicine, science, the military. There's business and workers, Wall Street, bankers, corporations, small business, big business. Um, there's the media, journalism, television, the press. There's religions. And then there's also protective services like the police, fire, EMT. All of these institutions are by and large non-political, or at least have been historically. And people have trusted them and believed in them and been willing to follow what they say, to believe in their efficacy, and to believe that in fact they can solve problems. So trust in these institutions is essential because it's the reason that people believe them, the reason people follow their dictates. Uh, we all sort of believe that banks are better than mattresses and doctors are better than self-healing. And maybe we even believe the police is better than vigilantism. Um, but right now, there's less and less trust in these institutions. Um, and that's a problem because these institutions can do things that we can't do alone. They can coordinate things. They can do big things. They can institutionalize memories, knowledge, and information. They can find ways to convert uncertainties into certainties by doing research and therefore being able to take big risks, partly because often institutions uh, aren't so uh, scared uh, of, of, of risks because they have the opportunity to spread risk over a portfolio of actions. Of course, institutions can become too big and they can fail to solve problems, but nevertheless, they have a lot of advantages to them. So it's because of institutions, I suspect, that you're probably listening to me. I have a PhD from MIT, a respected um, institution of higher education. I've taught at Berkeley since 1978. I've been president of the American Political Science Association. I'm a member of some honorary societies. My gosh, your group invited me here. So presumably I know something. Well, thanks. Thanks for your trust. Uh, if not in me, at least in the institutions with which I've been associated. But institutions are in peril. And what I want to do is show you, I'm not going to go through a lot of data here, but I want to show you a little bit of, of data and explain to you what's going on in the last 40 years with respect to institutions. So this is a presentation I gave recently at the American Political Science Association meetings. Uh, let me show you a chart that's well known in the political science community. And this has to do with trust in the presidency. And it's not surprising that trust in the presidency ebbs and flows. And you can see that in the jagged nature of this diagram. But this diagram actually has three lines on it. One line is Democrats trust in the presidency. And that's the blue line. The second line is Republicans trust in the presidency. That's the red line. And then there's independents trust in the presidency. And what you'll probably notice is, is several things. First, the lines actually get, the differences become bigger between the blue and the red lines over time. Uh, second of all, independents are sort of in the middle. That's the purple dotted line. Um, you also may notice that when there's a Republican president, the Republicans, who are the red line, have more trust in that president than the Democrats, who are the blue line. So we start with Ford Nixon, actually, um, and we find the red line above the blue line. Then Carter comes in and the blue line goes up. Then Reagan and then Herbert Walker Bush come in and the red line goes up and the blue line goes down and so on and so forth. This is telling us that not surprisingly, your partisanship, what party you identify with, has an impact on how you evaluate a presidency. If you're a Republican and there's a Republican president, then you evaluate the presidency more positively, all else equal, uh, than would a Democrat and vice versa for the Democrats. So these are data that go from 1973 to 2017. And what we're going to look at in a moment is more data like this. And these data are based upon questions from the Harris survey from 1967, uh, the general social survey from 1972, 
and the Gallup poll. And basically all of these questions ask about how much confidence or trust do you have in various institutions? And the interesting thing that I'm going to talk about is not just that trust in institutions has gone down, but also that polarization in trust in institutions has increased. Let me show you what I mean. So in 1974, if we take the trust the Democrats have for an institution and plot it versus the trust the Republicans in the American electorate uh, have for an institution, uh, we get these results for various institutions where all of the little dots are different institutions. So for example, uh, if you take law, which is down towards the bottom, you can barely see it, it's a small print, um, but it's a dot right on the purple line. The purple line is where people would be if Democrats had the same level of trust in that institution as Republicans. And in 1974, Democrats and Republicans had exactly the same level of trust in law. Uh, they didn't have any differences. They did, however, have differences in their trust for labor. Democrats trusted labor more than Republicans. That's not a surprise. That's part of the New Deal realignment that led to labor and business being the, the great axis of political difference in America. Similarly, Republicans, you see the, the thing that says business uh, with the oblong about it, the dashed oblong, uh, Republicans trusted business more than Democrats. And then we see other institutions. But what's interesting here is that except for labor and business, all of these institutions were within these dashed lines, the blue dashed line, the red dashed line. And those are basically a penumbra of more or less everybody has the same evaluation of the institution, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. The only institutions for which there were differences between partisans were labor and business. That's around 1974. Let's go to 2014. What you notice, and I'm just going to go back and forth here for a second, that's what it was in 1974, and suddenly we have all these institutions enclosed in these oblongs um, that are actually outside the penumbra of equality with respect to whether Democrats or, or Republicans trust them more. That is to say, now, in 2014, Democrats trust the press, TV news, K through 12 education, and higher education more than Republicans. Republicans trust religion and the military more. And if we actually had over time data, I could show you that actually the same is true with police. Uh, we don't have data that go back in time, so I didn't put it on this chart. But today, Republicans trust police more than Democrats. That's probably not so surprising given the news that we're hearing. The only institutions that are within this uh, the dashed lines are television in general, uh, law, medicine, and maybe science. Although science is interesting because in 1974, Republicans trusted science more than Democrats. But today, Democrats trust more science more uh, than Republicans. So another way to look at these data is to look at how things have changed over time and on the next slide, it's identical to the one I'm showing you, except for the fact I put all these crazy arrows on it. And basically what those arrows show you is where the institution was in 1974. That's the end of the arrow, not the point of the arrow, but the, the other end of the arrow. And the arrow point points to where they are in 2014. And if you look at these arrows, the first thing you may notice is essentially all of them go down. Uh, on the diagram. That means there's less trust in all institutions, except for one, and that's the military. That's interesting because probably in 1974, the military and trust in the military was still suffering from the uh, vestiges of the, of the Vietnam War and, and the mistrust that had been engendered by that. Uh, but for every other institution, trust goes down. What's also interesting is to see almost all of these arrows except for a very few that I've done in purple, 
actually go outward. That is to say, the institutions are moving from within that area, which was more or less equality in how the two parties and partisans of those parties evaluate them, to now being mistrusted by one party and trusted by the other. So this is a sea change in America in terms of how people think about institutions. Um, so that's the data I want to show you. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Well, actually, I'll leave it up, I think, for the moment. Um, and you'll, you'll have it there. So what's going on? Well, one of the things that's going on is the parties have changed in their composition over that period. It used to be that Republicans had both higher education and higher income than Democrats. Today, we actually find that people who are Republicans uh, tend to be people whose income tends to exceed what we would expect it to be given their education. So their income exceeds what we would expect given their education. Think of many small business owners. On the other hand, Democrats tend to be people whose income is less than what we'd expect given their education, or to turn it around, they have more education than we'd expect given their income. Think of a social worker or someone like that. These differences have now become ensconced in actually the minds of Americans and basically it leads to perceptions of the members of each party that are just stereotypical, but nevertheless real stereotypes in the minds of folks. Uh, Democrats have too much education for their own good. Republicans have too much income for their own good. And that kind of change is part of the reason why we get these changes in the way people perceive the institutions. So, what does this mean in terms of the ability of these institutions to get things done? Uh, that's what I want to talk about next. It means that, in fact, we have differences between the parties in people's attitudes about basic things having to do with science or with uh, any of these institutions. So, for example, in a June 11th to 15th Associated Press National Opinion Research Center poll, 81% of Democrats were at least somewhat concerned that they or a family member would get COVID, but only 52% of Republicans. 66% of Repo Democrats think that requiring people to say, stay at home is a good idea, but only 30% of Republicans. And a larger fraction of Democrats than Republicans think it's a good idea to wear a mask. So the really big change we see, especially with respect to those in institutions on the upper left-hand corner of the graph, higher education, K-12 education, TV news, the press, is that facts are now contested. People have different opinions depending upon their partisanship about whether COVID is dangerous, about whether African-Americans are really discriminated against in the criminal justice system. Is climate change real or a hoax? There's a partisan difference over whether or not science should be followed in the pandemic. Laura Ingram in our show in July said, take it with a grain of salt when people say follow the science. It's never difficult to find an expert on both sides of an issue. So this kind of attitude means that we have a world in which people less and less have agreement about what the facts are. And they have distrust in the institutions, if they're Republicans especially, in the institutions that provide facts and knowledge. And we've seen this in our president again and again and again. On the other side, we find a corresponding distrust on the part of Democrats in religion, in the military, and in police. Institutions that you can think of as institutions that provide uh, moral guidance or that provide um, uh, for social order. 
And the distrust on the part of Democrats in those institutions mean that they have doubts about whether those institutions as presently constituted can really be helpful to society. So the net result is it used to be in 1974 that we didn't have this kind of partisan difference in trust. As a result, institutions could go about their business and solve problems for us. People believed science. They believed academics. They believed that religious leaders were trying to do the best things for America. They believed that the police were trying to do things that were good for all of America. But now we have partisan division on those very issues. And we see it every single day in our politics. Well, what does this mean for the election? Um, I'm gonna change subjects slightly here. I wanted to alert you to this though, because I personally think this is one of the biggest issues we face in America. And I think that the current administration, it, it existed before the current administration. So it's not the, the result of Donald Trump. It might be partly the cause of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has, however, clearly and obviously, I think, exacerbated it and made it worse. Uh, and I think the partisan division means it's going to be very hard to get anything done in the future because the institutions that we rely upon to solve problems simply will not be ones that every member of the public believe in. And that's why we see things right now, such as defund the police movements. And on the other side, people who are talking about blue lives matter, police officers' lives matter, and a partisan division along those lines. Where does this leave the presidential election? Well, you see it in the presidential election. Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, keeps saying trust the science. Uh, Donald Trump keeps questioning the science. Climate change is a hoax. Um, he talks about remedies for uh, COVID, which scientists don't necessarily agree with. There's a debate as we sit here today about whether or not, in fact, we'll have a vaccine in a month. And the scientists seem to be saying no, and Donald Trump seems to be saying yes. So where's it going to lead us? Well, I think one thing it helps explain this tremendous partisan division with respect to institutions is one of the reasons why Donald Trump's support has never really gone below 40, 43, 45%. There are simply people who agree with Donald Trump that the institutions that they consider to be democratic institutions uh, are not trustworthy. And they agree with Donald Trump that the press puts forth fake news, that science is hokum, and that higher education is a place where people get indoctrinated. Um, my co-author and I uh, in 2019 ran a poll where we asked people uh, questions like, does higher education indoctrinate people? And Republicans were much more likely than Democrats to say yes to that question. Republicans were also much more likely than Democrats, although even Democrats agreed, that higher education was mostly Democrats, whereas the military is seen as mostly Republicans. So as we see these partisan divisions and these differences of opinion about these institutions, they become bedrock upon which somebody like Donald Trump can run a political movement and gain political support. And that's what he's done quite effectively. And it means that unlike other elections where we might have seen some movement in his support, we haven't seen very much. On the other hand, Donald Trump faces this problem. It turns out that independents, by and large, trust these institutions, uh, especially the ones that he's been attacking. And it means that he's going to have a very hard time, and the polls continue to reflect this, getting beyond his 40, 45% of the electorate. People simply don't believe, other than his base, that these institutions are to be completely rejected. To the contrary, uh, they believe these institutions are to be respected and believed in. So 
to the extent that Donald Trump keeps doing what he's doing, he's going to play to his base. And he's been keeping his base very secure, but he's not going to add to that base. And so far we've seen support for Biden 7% higher in the polls than Donald Trump. That's just been rock steady for months now. Um, it seems likely it'll stay rock steady. Um, it's hard to believe with uh, about six weeks left uh, until the election that we're going to see tremendous changes. On the other hand, we have the issues of October surprises. We also have issues of the problems of counting the vote, which we could talk about in question and answer uh, period. One of the reasons that it's clear that Donald Trump has not done a good job of expanding his base is when COVID came along, we usually get for almost any leader, a phenomenon called rally around the flag. The leader gets a big jump. When President George Herbert Walker Bush declared the Gulf War, he got a 30 percentage point bump. His son got a 40 percentage point bump at 9-11. Andrew Cuomo got a 30 percentage point bump uh, to 77% approval after COVID hit. Gavin Newsom has gotten a bump of about 40% to 70%, so a 30% net bump. Donald Trump's bump might have been four or five percentage points, but it was very temporary and it's gone away. He's now back down to about 43% approval and that's just remained very, very, very stable. So, What's going to happen in the election and why is Donald Trump having troubles? Well, elections are usually decided upon three things. Performance, traits of the candidate, and the opponent. The president, whatever happens, has to deal with the fact that he's been president during the COVID pandemic. And one of the, the things we find out in political science is uh, through some extraordinarily interesting work, is that it really doesn't matter whether you're responsible or not. It turns out if bad things happen, you're going to be held responsible. So we have some political scientists who looked at shark attacks off the Jersey coast and found out that the representatives in those districts uh, where the shark attacks occurred were hurt by the shark attacks, even though presumably uh, none of them had anything to do with the shark attacks. Uh, so the fact is, Bad performance in office, whether or not it's your fault, is going to hurt you. And that's true with respect to COVID, and that's true with respect to the economy as well. So the president has a lot to overcome. Traits of the candidate. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was looked upon as competent, but not particularly empathetic. In 2020, Joe Biden is looked upon as both competent and very, very empathetic. And President Donald Trump, although he's thought to be somewhat competent on the economy, is not thought to be a competent overall, certainly not with respect to COVID. And furthermore, he's absolutely definitely not thought to be empathetic. And if you saw the town hall the other night, you could see why. He, he just, there were softball questions asked of him that most political candidates would have shown a, a emotion, concern, uh, empathy, and he just simply couldn't muster it. So the final thing I mentioned was the opponent. As I've already said, Joe Biden is not Hillary Clinton. So Mr. Trump has tried very hard to find ways to overcome his problems. So he's talked about racial division and discord, hoping the law and order issue would help him. That doesn't seem to be helping that much, a little bit. There's some indication in the polls that people are not as favorable towards Black Lives Matter as they were uh, several months ago, but there's no indication that people have completely turned against Black Lives Matter or completely turned against Joe Biden with respect to the issue, partly because Biden has been pretty careful uh, in the way he's talked about these issues. Specifically, he's condemned looting, he's condemned violence. Second issue is mail balloting. Uh, now, that's not really an issue that you would normally think would bring you to the presidency, but what it might do is throw enough chaff in, into the a system, enough flack into the system, that it's going to make it hard on election day uh, and thereafter 
for people to believe the results. And that seems to be the major reason why he's focusing on that. And then another major thing he's focused on is opening up the schools and opening up the economy. But I think the data so far suggests that while his base is very much in favor of that, remember, part of his base is small business owners. And they are, of course, very much in favor of opening up uh, in most cases. Um, but it's not helping him beyond that. Uh, and it's so far clear that, by and large, people's concerns about COVID have overwhelmed their concerns about the economic issues. So what should Mr. Trump be doing? Well, he should be talking about creating a more resilient and more fair and more caring society. But this is just not the kind of issue that he can talk about. He doesn't seem to have much knowledge of how to think about it. Um, and he doesn't seem to have done much in the way of planning. We have not seen a national address on how to think about COVID or how to think about the economy uh, as we come back. What we've seen is addresses that talk about opening the economy, but he really hasn't talked about creating a new and more resilient economy. Um, he hasn't shown national grieving. Uh, he hasn't led that. Um, he just has not done a lot of things that might have helped him. Unlike FDR, and this, by the way, is mentioned in the new Woodward book at the very end. Um, unlike FDR in the 1930s, who experimented and tried new things in an alphabet soup of new agencies and laws, Donald Trump has done practically nothing that is innovative. Um, so where are we in terms of the campaign? Well, Donald Trump's situation looks a lot like Herbert Hoover in 1932 with the Depression, um, or Jimmy Carter's in 1980 when he was dealing with double-digit inflation and a misery index uh, in the teens. Misery index is the sum of unemployment plus inflation. Uh, and of course, Carter lost to Ronald Reagan. It looks like George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992 when the economy was really not in very bad shape, but bad enough shape that he lost to Bill Clinton, partly because of a third party candidate. Um, it looks like John McCain's in 2008 when he lost to Obama because of the economy. It does not look like Bill Clinton's situation in 1996 when Clinton won or George W. Bush's in 2004, uh, or Barack Obama's in 2012, when they were elected to second terms. Uh, the only analogy you can come up with is Truman's in 1948. Six months before the election, Truman was seven or eight, nine percentage points behind, and he managed to win the election. But Truman didn't face a pandemic, a poor economy, and racial division. And Truman was a much more empathetic figure than Donald Trump. Let me just end with a few words about the university. Uh, university, as you all know, is in a very serious situation with a $340 million uh, budget deficit from dealing with COVID. Uh, there's also the fact that the HEROES Act, which the Congress, the House has passed, but the U.S. Congress hasn't passed, uh, had in it a billion dollars for state and local governments. Uh, support for the university is key to the passage of that bill. Uh, without the passage of that bill, the university is probably going to have to have very large cuts and it's going to create great difficulties for the university. Um, on the other hand, I would say the university has been extraordinary in the way it's changed and been able to deliver first on a moment's notice education online but then I think in this fall, we've worked very, very hard to improve our education online. And I think students are actually seeing that, that there's been a lot of training, a lot of effort, and tremendous dedication by faculty who spent part of their summers, if not all of their summers, trying to improve their educational uh, technique with respect to online education. Uh, so I think higher education is to be really congratulated for what it's done. And despite the fact that we're thought of as stodgy and not very innovative, I think we've shown the ability to be incredibly resilient, uh, much more resilient than many other institutions. So the good news is I think we're gonna make it through this, uh, but it's gonna be hard times ahead. And it would be nice to think we would get some help from the federal government, which could really make an enormous difference with respect to our future. Um, so that's where we are. In an America where people distrust institutions, based upon their partisan perspective, higher education suffering from that, as well as the press and K through 12 education 
and TV news, but also religion in the military and police with respect to Democrats. This is not good news about where we are in America. And it means that there's a tremendous rebuilding job as we try to move forward, rebuild trust in American institutions, and make sure that eventually we can solve some of the tremendous problems that we face. Uh, I'm confident that Berkeley is going to be okay, although it's going to be a tough next few years. Um, but for America as a whole, we've got a difficult path ahead of us. And I'm extremely worried by the kind of loss of trust in institutions and especially the polarization in trust in institutions and what that means for our ability to solve problems. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Brady. We've got some great questions coming in. And uh, we um, just lead, let people know that if you do have questions, to enter them into the Q&A box, and we'll be able to manage those. Um, first is just was a clarification about the X and Y axis of the slide. Sure. Um, what, what, did, what units do they represent? Are they? Well, there, people answer a trust question, and they, the answers are like a five-point scale or a three-point scale. And so we just put numbers on them. And then they went from uh, zero to one, basically. We okay. rescaled them to go from zero to one. There's no scale like Fahrenheit or centigrade, or to put it another way, it's about as arbitrary as a Fahrenheit scale. Okay. That's really a better way to say it. It's so not uh, an absolute zero kind of scale. Okay, great. Um, we have a question uh, about uh, um, a lot of your endpoints time-wise are during the uh, Obama administration. Um, so how much of, the, of a component is racism in the, in the falling trust numbers among Republicans? Uh, I think that's a good question to be actually honest. I don't have an answer um, and I'd have to have other data to look at that. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Uh, and I, uh, so the next is, does his, um, does his impeachment, uh, President Trump, status come into play at all? No impeached president has, has been reelected, question mark. Well, I, right now it looks like he will continue that um, trend, uh, that he's not going to be reelected. But it's not clear that impeachment per se has had much to do with it. Although what's really hard to figure is the cumulative effect of all the things uh, about him. I mean, most recently, the, the uh, information that's come out about how he talks about the military in private strikes me as maybe much more important than probably the impeachment effort was. But on the other hand, those kinds of comments build upon what people have learned about him. And when those kinds of very, very um, telling anecdotes come out, they really help people formulate and solidify their opinions about somebody. Thank you. Um, how concerned should we be about reports that Trump has plans to contest the election in one way or another if he doesn't win? Uh, you know, I was in Florida in 2000. I was involved with the butterfly ballot case, uh, actually sat in courtrooms and worked with citizens groups on that. I know the maelstrom that ensued. Uh, I've never seen so many helicopters circling and so many crowds and all sorts of craziness going on. Um, I think that uh, it's possible uh, that in this election, uh, especially given the fact that many Democrats may vote by mail, uh, and so that we may find election night that in some areas it looks like Republicans are leading, and then in the subsequent weeks it'll become clear that in fact those areas went to the Democrats, um, that it's conceivable that in fact there will be people contesting the election all over the nation, uh, and that there could be issues with respect to that. Um, it, it, it is a worry. I mean, one reason why the Democrats believe that they really need to have an overwhelming victory is it, they believe that if that were possible, then perhaps on election night, it'll be so self-evident that Donald Trump has lost uh, that we won't have a need for subsequent uh, turmoil. Mm. Helpful perspective. Um, so we have a question here about the Hero, HEROES Act. So uh, McConnell says the HEROES Act is a Democratic wish list. Um, so in your presentation, you we're able to explain why, but how do we get th that through? Other good talking points you would recommend? Right. Well, I mean, it's sort of astonishing to me that in fact, it hasn't been a little more successful. Um, there are a lot of Republican governors who want the HEROES Act to go through. Uh, as you know, state governments by and large have to have balanced budgets. And right now they're facing tremendous uh, deficits because with the downturn in the economy, their tax revenues have gone way down, their expenditures have gone up, if anything, because of some of the costs of dealing with the 
uh, unemployment insurance, healthcare, and other things that have come up through this pandemic and unemployment. Uh, and therefore, they want the money from the federal government because it's the only place it can come from. Uh, the alternative is to raise taxes, which is not going to be popular at all. So because the federal government can do deficit spending, they would like the federal government to provide those monies. Uh, there's been a, a, a group in the uh, Congress, uh, which is uh, sort of the uh, centrist group of 50 uh, uh, members in the uh, House, 25 Republican, 25 uh, Democratic, and they put forth a bill that would have half a billion, half a trillion, sorry, half a trillion dollars uh, worth of aid for state and local governments. And that's a pretty middle of the road kind of group. Is it, you know, just to build on that, is it, does it have any teeth in it? You think it has some teeth uh, in it? Uh, it's hard to tell, yeah. From a public policy perspective, um, it's, um, they're called the Problem Solvers Caucus, right. by the way. Right. Um, from the, uh, speaking as a public policy dean and looking at what a compromise might look like, it strikes me that's a pretty good compromise of what it's got in it. Uh, the trouble is what does Mitch McConnell think? Um, and at this point, it's not clear the president has any incentive to move forward with such a bill. Uh, all it would do is maybe make it clear that there's still economic problems in the states uh, and that he doesn't want to talk about that. He wants to talk about how the economy is coming back and how everything's rosy. Uh, and so he sort of gets a twofer here. He doesn't have to push for spending the money uh, and he can claim that deficits are a problem. And on the other hand, he can also uh, avoid talking about how the economy still has troubles. Well, it was certainly a breath of fresh air to, to see that on the news hour last night, um, them, them talking and working together right. from, from my couch last night. Um, right. We have a question. Um, to address the polarization and lack of trust, can you speak to any policy initiative to help address and ameliorate the problem? Well, one thing would just be to have a president who doesn't constantly sow distrust and discord. Uh, that's part of what a leader needs to do. Uh, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, said one great American leader, FDR, at the onset of the Depression. Uh, Donald Trump has not come forth with that kind of statement. Uh, and so as long as we have a president who's fanning the flames, it's going to be hard to overcome the problems. But as I said, they predate President Trump. So part of the issue here is just the fact that, that we've become such a deeply partisan nation over various issues, and we need somebody who can find some ways to bridge those gaps. And I don't think that's going to be easy. Joe Biden says he's going to try, and I believe he will, but Obama couldn't do it. I don't think that, uh, and Bush even tried, in, in, if you may remember, uh, George W. Bush talked about trying to reach across the aisle. I, I think it's going to be very difficult. Well, that answered one of the next questions. So that Biden said he's willing to bring the country together. Is that even possible? So I think you uh, addressed that that's very related. Um, why uh, or what are the elements of trust that can be most affected positively? That's a very, that might be a topic for another uh, another yeah, well, presentation. It, there's four ways you get trust. One is that somebody delegates to you in a sort of regulatory way and says, you are the trusted entity. Uh, and so you are given authority, uh, like police departments are given authority. That works to some extent, but that really requires that government as a whole be seen as legitimate. And as I showed you, that's even in question these days. A second way you get trust is you perform well. You do good things. Uh, and uh, that's one way trust can be brought back. Another way you get trust is you adhere to the social norms of a society and people say, yeah, that's a group that I can really see that they're trying to be truthful or that they're trying to do things the right way. Um, the trouble is, is that there's been so much doubt shed on whether or not, for example, the press really is trying to be truthful that it's hard to bring that back. And then the fourth way is probably the hardest to change at all. And it's uh, cultures have make decisions about what institutions can solve what problems. Um, and so, for example, our culture for decades, if not centuries, believed the police were a necessary part of our society. Uh, that's even being doubted right now. And there's folks who would say that we should take apart police departments and have new ways of delivering the services that they provide. So it, basic cultural cognitive understandings of how institutions should operate are being uh, questioned right now. Now that's not occurring so much with respect to science or medicine, but I think there there's questions that are being raised about whether they really adhere to the norms of the society 
uh, or whether they're really being effective. But being effective is one of the best ways to restore trust. Mm, great. Thank you for that um, answer. Um, I have not read this, but um, let's see. Please comment on two other aspects of life in politics. Think, I think have major impacts upon the election. Healthcare, Trump has no plan, citizens worried, especially during pandemic, and the effects of the electoral college compared to the popular vote. He spoke only on the basis of the latter, I believe. Yeah, yeah. The, well, just to be quickly, the first one, healthcare. The president is again saying, and Mark Meadows was saying last night on the news, that uh, we have a health care plan, it's going to come out soon. This has been almost a, sort of a running joke in the administration because for years, literally at this point, they've been telling us they have a health care plan. I'm doubtful they're going to put one out, maybe right on the eve of the election, so that nobody can dissect it. Mm -hmm. uh, because in fact, if they put out a health care plan today, I think almost for certain, it would be no better than what Obama has created and probably worse. Um, and that would come out. They might just the week of the election put out something uh, because then they would have the chance to not really be scrutinized with respect to it uh, and feeling and then make gaudy claims about what it would do. But the truth is, it's going to be very hard for Republicans to come up with a health care plan, uh, especially one that's not at least like Obamacare. And certainly I'm sure it won't be like single payer uh, that will actually do better than what uh, we currently have with the remnants of Obamacare. As to the Electoral College, basically that gives Trump a, a 10 percentage point uh, advantage in the following sense. If you take the prediction of whether he's going to win right now, uh, 538 says Biden has about a 75 percent chance of winning, but he would have an 86 percent chance of winning if it were just the popular vote that counted. So that's a significant impact on the probability of winning. Uh, in terms of percentage of the vote that that means, it's probably two, three, four percentage points of the vote. So in other words, Trump has to get two, three, maybe even four percentage points less of the vote uh, than he would otherwise have to get to win because of the Electoral College. So it gives him a substantial advantage. Uh, that's why the Democrats are hoping that they win by 7%, which is the current polling difference because that way it would be clear that the Electoral College is going to Biden. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let um, uh, Michelle Woods Pickens know that what came in, I, if you want to re-ask your question, it's not very clear there. Um, we have a question about what do you think of the theory that President Trump is beholden for Putin? Well, I, I'd be purely speculating, but I, I'm willing to speculate. I mean, it certainly has been, I, one of the things I'm doing is writing a book about the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I actually know a little bit about the Soviet Union and, and Russia, um, but I don't know anything about this, to be honest. Um, it has certainly been astonishing to see the degree to which Donald Trump seems to favor people like Putin um, and, and the head of North Korea, uh, folks who are really uh, not nice people. I mean, there's awful people. Uh, and he seems to like dictators. So maybe that's just his character trait. He likes people who are authoritarian. Uh, at the same time, it's been surprising how much he seems to be enthralled of Putin in Russia, and maybe there's something there. Uh, we do know that Deutsche Bank uh, provided a lot of loans to, to Mr. Trump. We do know that Deutsche Bank was looked upon as the place that sort of played fast and loose with funds and monies, and perhaps there's some Russian connection, but that's something historians, I hope, can sort out for us. Uh, it'd be wonderful to see Mr. Trump's tax returns, which might answer the question for us. Great. Long requested. Um, question is, uh, Trump has found himself in a public contradiction of his own statements repeatedly. How can his, <laughs> how can his base continue to trust a proven liar? <laughs> well, I, again, I think it's, it, it's really a bit of a mystery, and it certainly made us political scientists stop and think, because I think we had a much more rational notion uh, of the general public. I mean, one answer to this is, suppose you're uh, a businessman uh, or woman, and you've made a lot of money because of tax cuts, uh, the big Trump tax cut. It's pure self-interest. Suppose you're uh, of Catholic background and think abortion uh, is a terrible thing. Uh, Donald Trump is giving you Supreme Court justices that you think might help reverse Roe versus Wade. So part of it is just simply people are getting the things that they want uh, and that 
they are therefore uh, projecting, and we know that projection is a very powerful thing, onto Donald Trump all sorts of good things, uh, despite all the things. I mean, and you do see lots of people who say, I really don't like him as a man, but, but at least he's giving us the things we want. And I think that's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, do you really think the election will be decided on election night or go weeks or months or longer? Uh, I think it's possible it'll be decided on election night if the polls stay steady at 7% lead for Biden. I would expect them to close a few percentage points, but this has been such a strange time and everything's been so rock steady, it's conceivable they don't. If it's a seven percentage point difference in the polls, it strikes me that on election night, it'll be pretty clear uh, that the Electoral College has gone in favor of Joe Biden. Uh, if it closes to be four, three, four, five percentage points, then it may be harder for uh, the election night returns to show a, a result one way or the other. Is there anything a citizen can do about lack of trust in institutions? And I found those four um, points of trust really um, helpful and essential. Well, I, you know, one of the things I've tried to do at the Goldman School with only limited success is to try to constantly emphasize to my students that we're going to be a place where we think of all perspectives and entertain all perspectives. Um, and uh, the trouble is, is that sometimes one perspective or another is so extreme that it's, it, it really is hard to stomach the fact that we should entertain it. Uh, somebody who, who would make racist statements or something like that, what are you gonna do with that? Um, and we're in a time when, so it's hard to sort of say that we're gonna be an institution, higher education, that will be the place that will focus on free speech, all sorts of opinions and so forth. I know our chancellor, Carol Christ, has been devoted to that. And I really admire her for it. And I've tried to do the same at the Goldman School. And I think each of us for our own institutions has to think of the ways that we keep people's trust. So for, I think for one way we keep trust is not only performing well in terms of turning out graduates who are successful, but also by showing that we adhere to certain social norms that are important, such as uh, all perspectives get heard and debated. Uh, that's an important social norm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, each of us can think about our institution, what norms, what performance criteria, what cultural and cognitive understanding it's based upon, and try to deal with those kinds of things. Right now, by the way, one of the things we need to deal with is, I think quite rightly, we've been told that we need to do a better job with respect to racism in America. And I think we're all trying really hard to make sure we have not just neutral institutions, but actually actively anti-racist institutions. That is to say, institutions that take a clear stand that racism is unacceptable and that also act in ways to try to alleviate any vestige of racism. This is more of a, um, a direct concrete question. What percentage of the population are Republicans, Democrats, and independents? Well, that's actually turned around uh, and gone up and down. Uh, but right now, um, and I haven't actually looked at the figures recently, but it's probably something like about a 30, 40% Republican, uh, 40 to 50% Democratic and the rest independent. But it partly depends on how you define independent. Um, so for example, when we ask the normal uh, question about party identification, we ask, are you a Republican or a Democrat? But then we often follow up with, if they say they're independent, do you lean Democratic or lean Republican? And if you include the leaners, then the group of Republicans and Democrats gets bigger. If you don't include the leaners and you call them independents, then the group of independents get bigger. One of the things that certainly happened in the last 40 years is there are more independents than there used to be by any definition. Interesting. I have a bit longer of a question. Just a few more here. Um, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Trump mistakenly used the term herd quote unquote herd mentality yes. yesterday when he was talking about COVID yeah. herd immunity. In reality, it, it appears the Republican senators seem to exhibit herd mentality, except for occasional resistance. Are we now facing this continued strict party line voting with no efforts for compromise? Is this the future for the US Congress? Well, given the polarization that I described with respect to institutions and partisan politics, I think the answer is yes. Here's the problem. 
is that a person on the left or on the right worries about being primaried. So we've taken a noun, a primary, and turned it into a verb. And to be primaried is this. You're the incumbent Democrat, and people are mad at you because you haven't been liberal enough, and therefore they go and get some more extreme candidate who can win in the primary because the Democrats in that district tend to be more liberal rather than moderate, and therefore the more extreme candidate gets the nomination and you have been primaried. The same thing happens on the Republican side. So our current system leads to the possibility of being primaried and every politician lives in fear that he or she is gonna lose the seat in Congress or in the Senate or whatever office they hold by somebody primarying them. Interesting. Um, this is a Latinx question. So there's been a great deal of discussion about Latinx vote as if it is homogeneous, a homogeneous block. There's also a good deal of criticism of Biden for not reaching out more to this group. Does your research shed any light on what is important to this critically important group? Well, that, I mean, that's interesting because in fact, as the person says, they are really somewhat heterogeneous. Um, I mean, remember, uh, some Latinx uh, are Catholic, some are actually evangelical Christian, uh, some are from Cuba and have one perspective on authoritarian regimes, others are from other places where they're much more liberal with respect to authoritarian regimes or, or just not so concerned about those issues. Uh, so you really have very diverse communities. You have Puerto Ricans and you have uh, uh, Cubans and you have uh, folks who have been in America for hundreds of years who are uh, Hispanic origin in New Mexico, for example, and, you, and also in Texas. Uh, and then you have folks who are brand new to America. Uh, so there's just lots of different perspectives. Um, I think it is the case that because many Latinx voters are actually Catholic, that they tend to be somewhat conservative on some issues with respect to uh, abortion, um, uh, much more so than, uh, for example, African-American voters. And that's part of the ways in which the Trump administration has been attractive to them. Also, many of them are small business owners. And again, that's uh, the Trump administration's attractive to them for the reasons I described earlier. Hmm. Um, let's see, so uh, what might be the impact of the Republican-led voter suppression moves? Polls are one thing, but if people can't vote, dot, dot, dot. Well, there's all sorts of efforts going on along those lines, as you know, purging of uh, voters lists is one way that's done uh, and to over purge them uh, to sort of eliminate voters who actually really are voters. Uh, there's also uh, efforts to disenfranchise felons or ex felons who have served their time who are trying to get back the franchise and who have actually like in Florida been given uh, the chance to do that. But nevertheless, there's been Republican efforts to hold that up. Um, then there's also just the whole brouhaha about mail in ballots. The fact that six months ago, sadly and tragically, we as a nation didn't just decide we should make it possible for everybody to vote by mail um, is really sad. Uh, and that's going to perhaps lead to some voter suppression. It's not clear that's going to necessarily help the Republicans, though, because it turns out, at least historically, a lot of Republican voters voted by mail. Donald Trump votes by mail. William Barr votes by mail. Uh, so it's not clear where that's going to lead. And I think actually that has been more about Donald Trump trying to cast doubt on the results of the election more than actually doing voter suppression per se. But obviously, if, if that occurs as well, I, I'm sure he wouldn't uh, feel bad about it. Um, so uh, I think voter suppression is an issue. Now I'm, I'm frankly more worried about counting the votes on election night, early calls of the election by the networks, and the possibility it will be in a situation, again, like 2000. There's actually now legislation in Congress about having the date the electors meet uh, moved up uh, so that there's a little more time to count the votes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's one more question here. Um, so if you, if you were advising the Biden campaign, uh, where would you have him focus his campaign? <laughs> well, I certainly would not do what the uh, Clinton campaign did in the closing days of 2016. But if you may remember, they went to Arizona thinking that they were going to do very, very well. Uh, and then, of course, the Comey announcement came and uh, other things occurred. Um, they were, I think, much too optimistic about where they stood. And I think if I were Biden, I would be 
playing the game he's playing, which is to be very safe, to focus on the battleground states, and to make sure that you have those locked up. Uh, it's Florida, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, that you have to really focus on and make sure that you win those states. Uh, because if you don't win those states, you're, you're simply not going to win uh, the election. Uh, Patty, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Um, and I just, um, the questions like most of our presentations are just as, the conversation is just as wonderful. So thank you, Professor Brady. Um, thank you. Patty. I, I, I want to add my thanks. Um, we appreciate you taking your time out as I'm sure you are so busy and the next five weeks are going to be even busier for you. I'm, I'm sure I'm dealing with the students. So we really appreciate you taking your time. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, and this is, of course, a really important election. So, uh, but even the deeper problem, polarization and trust in America has me worried. And I think we all have to be aware of it. And I think as folks who have been associated with the University of California, I think we have to be worried about making sure that we continue to have the public's trust. Yes, absolutely. So thank you again. Thank you everybody for participating and, and, and tuning in.